This next panel, we're going to try to put a, a face on the economic impacts, describe some of the programs that are out there and, and what's working in terms of, of helping with this transition. I'm pleased to be able to introduce Jeremy Richardson, Richardson from the Un Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, he's a senior energy analyst, um, long time, uh, his family has been in coal and, he gets, and he's got West Virginia roots, so Jeremy's a perfect person to be able to lead this discussion. Jeremy. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is uh, so great to be home. Thanks a lot, uh, Jamie, for having me and for organizing this event. I come from a third generation coal mining family uh, here in the northern part of West Virginia uh, and am a graduate of uh, WVU. I won't say what year. Um, but the, uh, this is really uh, personal for me and is, is part of my uh, professional um, work. Um, I like to joke that I'm the my, my brother is the, is the coal miner in the family. I'm the, the black sheep of the family that went off and became a scientist. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, um, my organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists, has really, um, has really been one of the leaders uh, trying to raise this issue about uh, worker transition in the coal fields. Um, and we've done a lot of work uh, trying to... to um, to advance that conversation. And so it's very exciting to be here to see this conversation has come so far uh, since our forum a couple of years ago in Charleston um, because there are really exciting examples of people doing great work uh, and there are actual policy ideas uh, on the table. So that's very exciting to me personally. Um, but I think we have to address this conversation in a, in a very sort of respectful way. Um, you know, the way that I like to tell people outside of West Virginia who don't come from coal, coal mining families that talking about climate change uh, is roughly equivalent to, to a coal miner, is roughly equivalent to somebody barging into my living room and saying, Jeremy, the fact that you're a scientist is destroying the planet and you have to do something else now, right? It's a part of my identity as a person that I'm a scientist. Um, and so what I want to introduce the, uh, this next discussion uh, are some people that are helping to write a new story for what this, uh, what this region and what this state could be. And it gives me uh, quite a bit of uh, inspiration to see some of the work uh, that's going on by some of these great folks. So it is my pleasure. I won't uh, belabor the introductions. We have uh, five great folks to, to give you their perspective on what's going on on the ground. Uh, and first, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, Jeff Whitehead uh, from Eastern Kentucky. All right, great. Uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to sit here. Uh, I'm not going to be, be speaking long. Lots of good news this morning, right? Uh, uh, I, am, uh, I cover 23 counties in Eastern Kentucky and work with a workforce agency trying to put coal industry workers back to work. So I'm kind of your boots on the ground guy. We've lost 8,000 coal mining jobs in my 23 counties over the last couple of years. That's a 41% decline. We have uh, over 25,000 fewer people working today in those counties than we did just two years ago. We've got county governments that are really struggling to provide just basic services. So uh, not to, I'm trying to avoid the temptation to, to continue the, the bad news. It's, it's bad. Uh, but a lot of the conversations in Eastern Kentucky are positive, but far too many of them kind of go like this. If you're not wanting to be a teacher or you don't want to be a nurse, you better get ready to move away because there's just not much else around here other than that. And far too often, the people in the room are nodding in agreement to that conversation, and not enough people are saying, no, not true. Because of all of the changes in technology and the way we work today in the workplace nationally, it is erasing some of the barriers to economic development in our mountainous region uh, <clears throat> that wasn't possible a few years ago. So we need a new narrative, and that narrative needs to be written by us and not about us. 
right? Um, the result of having this single industry economy uh, is oftentimes that the workforce within that industry gets stereotyped, right? And while it's true that a vast number of people in the coal industry have great aptitude and interest in mechanical abilities, they also have other interests and aptitudes, sometimes even greater than the ones that they're using in that industry, the artist, artistry and, and scientific, social. Uh, many have a lot of entrepreneurial kinds of aptitude and interest. And it's that diversity that's within this great workforce that we have, who gets up before dark and gets home after, after dark every day who are many of our most ambitious people. They're the people who looked around and said, you know what, um, this is the best way for me to provide for my family, send them to school, and pursue, pursue my view of happiness. So the coal industry offered that. Um, so that's who that diversity within that workforce, I think, provides a a lot of potential for, for growth and economic development and the diversification of, of our region economically. So in addition to a new narrative, I think we need to reimagine what's possible. I want to introduce uh, a video here in just a second. When, when Rusty Justice, who's a co-founder of BitSource in Pikeville, Kentucky, uh, which is a startup software company, when he learned, along with his partner and, and others, that computer coding is a trade not unlike welding. Uh, his career as a civil engineer and in construction in the coal, in coal business told him that many of the coal industry workers had the aptitude and the interest and the thinking style to be coders. So we partnered with him and, and we have 10 coal miners that are now doing computer coding. On the wall at BitSource, there's a photograph of the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, they're there as a reminder to those guys that those astronauts proved what something that had not been done could be done. And it's a reminder to them that they are doing that for us. They are proving what has not been done in Eastern Kentucky can be done and that they are, like those astronauts, a pioneers of a new era uh, for the region. So this is one example of that new narrative and that reimagining of our region that's taking place. And I believe proof that diversification of our region is not a bridge too far. It is worth that investment into the region. Uh, and so much needed. but but so tangible, I think, in terms of, of what we can become. So I want you to meet Garland Couch here in this video, and I want you to pay particular attention to just a brief little statement he makes about his son that I think is real important. I started out with a, uh, a laboratory doing cold water and soil analysis. I uh, worked there for about eight years and then got an opportunity with Arch Coal. Worked there until July of 2014 and the company that I was with closed. Uh, I heard a radio ad. I was driving down the road and it came on and said, you know, this is going to be something that we're going to do and it's an available job that you might be able to stay at home. So I applied for the job online, went through an assessment. They had an assessment that you had to take and I was lucky enough to be selected out of that to have an interview and here we are. But you're not really enjoyed any type of computer work and uh, phone apps and video games and anything tech related. As far as code goes, I had never even seen code. When I came here for the first time, you know, there was a little stress. I, you know, can I do this? You know, is, is this something I can do? And, you know, luckily enough, it, I, I think it's something I can do and it's been pretty enjoyable learning it. We've learned, I think, five complete languages, computer languages, which is you know, the code that the, that the uh, computer reads to output something to the screen. 
So we've learned, I think, five of those languages in five months. It's been an interesting adventure to get to take the tools that we've learned and put them to use. You know, like, like most coal miners, I've worked with a lot of people and know a lot of coal miners. And uh, this is definitely something that, that we as an industry can turn into. We can, we can look to this. I hope more people will, will follow our lead. Um, I know a lot of the friends and colleagues that I had as an employee in the coal industry are gone. They've had to move away. And then there's a lot more that's hurting. That's, that they're facing the same decision I was of, do I go and leave everything I've ever known? Or you know, do I stay home and there's not much here? When the call came for this job, uh, me and my family were in our car headed to Louisville. We were going there to accept or reject a job that I'd been offered. So we were leaving. We we were literally <laughs> we were literally leaving. You know, we were we were on our way. This job came through, and thankfully it came through. And you know, we discussed it, and we decided it was something that we wanted to give a try, and try to stay home. You know, to try to keep our family here where we want to be. We didn't want to move to Louisville or Lexington. You know, we wanted to stay where we love to be, and this job gave us the opportunity to do that. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Really appreciate you sharing the story. Um, let me bring up uh, Brandon Dennison, who is the one of the founders of the Coalfield Development Corporation. You got a PowerPoint? Uh, Coalfield Development. We're a nonprofit. We're headquartered in Wayne County, West Virginia, right on the Kentucky border. We also work in Mingo and Lincoln, and we have some strategic partnerships in McDowell County. Uh, that's good, yeah. And we absolutely subscribe to the notion that when it comes to this transition thing, uh, nobody's going to do it for us. So we're eager to have investment, we're eager to attract investment to the region, but we know we've got to do this ourselves from the bottom up. There's no white knight. And at Coalfield Development, we're committed to doing that in, in really tangible, with our hands type kind of ways. We're a family of social enterprises. Uh, social enterprise is this concept you take a charitable mission and you blend that with, with the efficiency of the business world and, and you, you blend the value of the charitable world with the business world. So these are real jobs that we create. Uh, we work what we call a 33, six and three model. We hire uh, unemployed people to work 33 hours a week paid. We start out uh, between 10 and 12 bucks an hour. Six hours a week, we're in the community college classroom, working towards an associate's degree. And three hours a week, we're doing life skills, which are really important things like money management, time management, goal setting, teamwork, leadership, the intangibles that are really important to success in, in business. So we started out in construction. You can see over here, uh, we sustainable construction, lead, modern, green technologies. Got involved in solar panel installation. We're getting ready to spin off a whole enterprise just in solar installation. You saw in all these charts, solar was going like this. And we're primed to, to create real jobs on this curve. Um, woodworking, so tapping back into the artisan trades that come natural to the people of West Virginia. And our newest enterprise is in agriculture. So I'm gonna bring up Ben Gilmer, who's the president of Refresh Appalachia. That's our agriculture enterprise. Uh, and he's gonna tell you all about that and you're gonna hear from some of our crew members. And while he's coming up, I'll just show you, this is what it's all about. So our, our trainees are with us for two and a half years. The contract ends when they earn that associate's degree. The vast majority, nine out of 10, are the first in their family to earn a degree. And then they're ready for success in the private sector or maybe even to start their own business as entrepreneurs. Ben. Thank you. Um, Brandon mentioned we were going to talk a little bit about Refresh Appalachia as one of our social enterprises, just to give you a flavor of the sort of day-to-day -day work we do with their enterprises and, and how we approach our work. Um, in general, recognizing, sort of echoing Jeff's comments, that there's going to be a number of strategies that are needed to uh, revitalize the coal fields, and agriculture, we feel, is one of those strategies. Not the only solution, but one. So with Refresh Appalachia, we are really trying to build a local food economy in the southern coal fields that provides living wage jobs, builds and retains community wealth, and also provides access to food. And 
So we are, we have three core pillars to our work, I guess. One is growing the farmers, so actually training new and beginning farmers. Strengthening systems, and by that we mean how do we build these systems to aggregate and distribute product from air producers but other regional producers to help them reach these larger markets. And then, as I mentioned before, increasing access to communities in need of fresh, healthy food because there are a lot of those communities in the coal fields. So those are our three core areas. I'm going to kind of walk through each of those so you can get a picture of that, and then you'll hear directly from our crew members who are, who are doing the work. Um, I'm sorry, this is hard to see from the back, I'm sure, but this graphic really sums up the system and how we're trying to address it. The bottom graphic here, this is a conventional basically your conventional food system. So you may get your lettuce from California in the winter. Well, it travels by freight, water, if it's in Mexico, it might travel by sea, uh, you know, air, train, and eventually gets here to West Virginia where somebody buys it and consumes it. That's the only West Virginia job in this chain. And we feel like that that's a system we can change. And this top graphic, is what we call a food hub. So that's what we're developing, this system of aggregation and distribution, direct from producer to aggregate, distribute, store, and take it right to our local consumers or export out of the, the region. That top graphic, those are all West Virginia jobs or Central Appalachia jobs, and that's what we're working toward. Working toward. Um, we say that because there's an actual demand. This isn't just for the um, people to go to Whole Foods to buy local food. Um, in West Virginia, we spend $6 billion a year on food, and we produce less than $1 billion. So that's a big market opportunity. And to just drill down a little bit, to just look at vegetables that are seasonally produced, so that's those that we can sort of easily grow in season. We currently produce about $5 million worth of revenue. This is a study from actually WVU and Downstream Strategies here in Morgantown. So we produce $5 million a year, and if we just provided and sourced 75% of our seasonal vegetable demands, that would add another $25 million of revenue. It's, that's, that's achieve, we feel that's achievable, so we're working toward that. But it's not without challenges to build this system. Uh, so we have to grow the growers. The average age of farmers in West Virginia is over 60 years old. That we don't have this next generation of farmers that are coming up. So we have a, our approach, applying the Coalfield model brand and outline. We uh, hire uh, our trainees to work on the job on-the-job training. We have workshops and classes for the other producers in the community as well um, to, to grow the growers and, and mentorship and life skills development. These are some of our crew members here, um, our Wayne crews and uh, Wayne County crews. And um, we also, we call, so our farming actually happens on learning farm incubators, that's what we call them. So these are places where we're producing and we're a business, we're, we're growing product but it's a, an incubator in the sense that we're incubating our trainees and we're also training other folks in the community. So if we do some special project, we invite the community to come learn about it. And we have a couple of sort of core principles to our work. We want to use low cost production techniques that can be easily adopted by other producers or uh, and regionally appropriate techniques to meet local markets, not trying to do real high cost, high barrier stuff. Um, and I wanted to just give you a quick tour of some of the work we're doing and where we're doing it before we move on. Um, in general, I'd say that, you know, we're operating in very common environments in southern West Virginia, and that's very intentional. So this is a surface mine we're working on in Mingo County, about 300 acres post-mine land use. And we're working with the Mingo County Redevelopment Authority and the Williamson Health and Wellness Center there to repurpose this site into a productive agriculture enterprise. And uh, one that produces revenue and jobs, but also reclaims, further reclaims the property and builds this into a community asset. So if you go there right now, and I, you're welcome anytime, but uh, if you go there right now, you probably see some of our crews chasing about 300 pastured poultry chickens <laughs> around the top of this mountain. And those are egg layers. Those eggs are gonna be going to Charleston, to a couple of different restaurants, to some schools. We're putting in next week, we'll be putting in about 20 different beehives for honey production. We're going to be doing other livestock there, building greenhouses. So that's all going to be happening here, here on this site. Um, and sustainable forestry practices as well. The idea that we're remediating as we produce revenue. Um, we're working in Lincoln County. Just real quick, we're at the high school there. And one of our crew members will talk a little more in detail about this. But I just wanted to point this out as like a really unique opportunity. We're talking about transitioning the workforce. These high school technical programs are such a, an asset. 
and and we can we, we can do a lot more investment there. So we're working there, and you'll hear more about that. Uh, in Wayne County, we are in a former factory. Uh, this a multi-use factory, but part of the factory. This was an abandoned factory. We're repurposing for agriculture, so we're growing microgreens in there that will be sold to urban markets. We're doing a lot of our aggregation and storage there as well, and we have some outdoor growing in high tunnels in parking lots. Uh, so um, those are some of our sites, just a brief overview. I mentioned before that strengthening the system part, and that's a big key barrier that a lot of folks, not just us, are working on, folks in this room as well. Um, we're building some a series of aggregation and network distribution facilities throughout southern West Virginia to work with other producers. And, and you know, just the best example of that is if you are a store manager at Kroger and you want what local product, you don't want to work with 50 different farmers to like piece together your quota, right? You want somebody to show up with your delivery and it needs to look good. So that's part of what we're doing with other people to really help out all of the producers that we work with. Um, and finally, uh, I mentioned food access before. Uh, this is actually a really innovative group here at WVU, West Virginia Food Link, uh, trying to highlight communities in need of food. And so we're working with, with them and other partners to figure out how can we how can we play a role in that, making sure that people have access to those foods. So I will be quiet and let other people talk here, but um, I wanted to point, they told me, to our crew members, to, to, to tell you as consumers to look for our logo on the shelves, because, you know, <laughs> we are a social enterprise and we're trying to sell stuff. Uh, but uh, I'll pass it over to the crew. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot, Ben, and thanks, Brandon. We are really lucky uh, today to have a couple of the crew members that have gone through uh, the training that Brandon uh, has described and, and Ben has talked about. Uh, so I'd just like to have, we have a few minutes to, to hear a little bit about their story. Uh, so let me introduce Colt Brogan and Glenn Wilson. Um, and uh, just a couple questions here. So uh, guys, can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of your background and how you ended up you know, working with, with the Coalfield Development Corporation? Well, before I joined uh, Coalfield, I was a, well, I was a veteran, you know, I was in the military, and um, when I got out, I came to my cousin, which, you know, he was one of the first people to ever be with Coalfield. Uh, he was one of the first graduates. Talked to him, and I, I asked him what he did, and, and how he's doing, and he told me about Cofield, and told me about Brandon, and what Cofield's all about. Uh, told me all the opportunities that is given to you, like through going through college and stuff. And you know, to me, it sounded something that I would be interested in. And um, got uh, got him to talk to Brandon for me, and, and now I'm here. This is where I am today. I graduated last year from Lincoln County High School, and now I attend Southern Community College. Um, and for me, uh, where I was at, I didn't have much opportunity, and I didn't know what I was going to do after I left high school. And uh, so I completed the uh, plant systems part of the agriculture program at my school, and my uh, FFA advisor actually linked me up with Coalfield, and I had an interview with Brandon and was hired a week after I graduated. That's fantastic. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit about, I mean, uh, Ben gave us a flavor of some of the projects that, um, that Coalfield is working on, but can you tell us uh, some of the stuff that you've, you guys have worked on, some of the projects? Uh, well, in Coalfield, I've actually, I'm like a jack of all trades, because I've been around. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Coalfield's, uh, grown so much as just starting out it was just construction yeah and uh it's moved on uh doing more and better things like solars coming into play uh ags coming into play and it's just grown in like just two years for me and you know i went from construction to deconstruction and then Went to timber framing, you know. There's a house in Mingo County right now. Uh, pretty much, it's almost finished. And uh, now I'm getting to do the one thing that I've been dreaming of doing of a long time that I've done with my papa is woodworking. 
and now I'm into that, and you know I'm getting, I'm creating things that you know, that bring me back to me and my papa, and uh, quite honestly, it's you know good progress in Cofield. For me, well, like Glenn, I've done more than one, been in more than one enterprise in Coalfield. Uh, I started doing deconstruction. We've, uh, I actually got to deconstruct two homes completely, and that was a learning experience, and that kind of gave me something to look forward to when we started doing construction. Um, it was a big change. And then I got to do, you know, just like Glenn, I got to start doing something I love, which was agriculture. And um, I actually got to partner up with my FFA chapter in the agriculture program at the school I graduated from. And now uh, me and my coworkers, you know, we're in partners with the agriculture program and we get to manage their, their equipment and uh, I think there's a lot of potential there for growth. That's great. You know, from, from where I sit, a lot of this is um, sort of policy discussions about, you know, how do, we, how do we get the right policies in place. But for people like my brother, who, who's an active coal miner, it's very much a kitchen table conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I wonder if you guys can tell us a little bit about sort of what your vision is for, for the future of the coal fields. Well, when I look at coal, coal to me is not really going anywhere. And my dad, he was a coal miner, and he, he'll tell you that, you know, coal's going down. And I see Cofield, you know, they're bringing up opportunities and, and people need support to meet those needs. And, you know, we got hundreds of, you know, sh strip mines, you know, just sitting there and we're starting, you know, doing solar. I mean, there's good opportunities for solar plants for all these strip mines. And you know, it can go it can go a hundred directions, but one thing that Cofield doing it's going up and it's going up fast. So I have to agree. What we're doing is we're diversifying our options here with Col with that Cofield, and uh, we're turning all these these Appalachian problems in into opportunities for people to to have jobs. Um, so there's so much we can do with those problems that we can. There's remediation of contaminated homes. There's deconstruction of, uh, sh of dilapidated structures. Uh, there's the reclaiming of wood and like what Glenn does, they take that reclaimed wood and they turn it into uh, furniture. Um, there's, there's renewable resources such as solar. There's uh, sustainable agriculture. Just really recycling and upcycling what we already have here in Appalachia. Great. Well. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to take a second to um, thank both Colt and Glenn for sharing, sharing their stories with us. It's, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, the great work that's happening in the coal fields is, is really an inspiration to me in, in the work that I'm doing. And, and so I thank you for everything you're doing. I think that's all the time we have. So. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Brandon and Ben. Next panel, we want to uh, bring up Kelly Goes from the law firm of Jackson Kelly. Uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, she's going to serve as the moderator for this panel. Also going to have Keith Burdett, who's our current uh, cabinet secretary for the West Virginia Department of Commerce, and Tom Haywood from the law firm of, of Bowles Rice. We'll have Kelly serve as the moderator on this next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.